Good evening and thank you for joining us. It looks like we've still got quite a few people rolling in, but I'll get us started for this evening as we are recording and the recording will be shared um, after the event today. My name is Olivia Carvalho and I'm the Urban Engagement and Events Coordinator for Birds Canada. This is For the Love of Loons with Kathy Jones, Volunteer Manager and Biologist for Birds Canada, an info session on the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey. This webinar is presented by Birds Canada as part of the Toronto Bird Celebration, which is a month-long festival of events that celebrates spring migration all throughout the greater Toronto area and through the magic of Zoom online. The Toronto Bird Celebration would not be possible without the generous support of Birds Canada, TD Friends of the Environment Foundation, Koa Optics, Armstrong Bird Food, and Patterson Outdoor Advertising. I'll invite you all to use the Q&A function to, and to enter any questions that you have during the presentation tonight. Uh, know that there will be time at the end for uh, Kathy to hopefully tackle those for you, but we're hoping that this webinar will cover the majority of the ones that were submitted in advance. Um, once again, noting that a recording will be shared with you afterwards. And with that, I turn it over to Kathy Jones. Thanks, Olivia. I'm just getting things a little bit more sorted out here. The slides are never exactly as you want it with these things, you know. Um, and I need to, did you, can you share my slides or do you want me to make, do that? Or are they shared already? I can share yours. Oh, you're, there we go. There, you've got them. Perfect. I've got them. Welcome everybody. My name is Kathy Jones and I'm with Birds Canada and with the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey. Um, um, tonight, um, I would start by acknowledging Oh, we should start with our little ice picker poll that um, Olivia has just put up for us. And we'll do that. We'll go farther after that. Um, but I don't see why I cannot talk while this is on. What do you think, Olivia? Yeah, I think you're, you're good to go. People yeah. are already using it. I see that. So um, tonight, I would like to acknowledge that we are coming from the traditional lands and unceded territories. At least I am of the Haudenosaunee, the Adirondack, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississauga peoples, and that I my person, myself personally in Port Rowan, Ontario, is within the 1792 um, Treaty 3, which is sometimes called the Between the Lakes Treaty. The Common Loon, the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey, occur in the traditional lands and territories of many First Nation communities. And Birds Canada understands that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems. And we support the needs, aspirations, and rights of, of Indigenous communities to um, care for the land. Um, how are we doing on the poll? Should I move on? Yeah, it looks like things have slowed quite a bit there. We've got over 75, oh, 80% of people have uh, have taken to the poll. That's great. One of the reasons I like to include these polls, because I really, really like to know my audience so I can cater my talks to the audience. How are we, what do we have? Um, if you don't mind um, sharing that information, Olivia. Yeah, it looks like about 77% of us tonight are uh, residing in Ontario or joining from Ontario. Uh, we have got folks from actually everywhere except for Prince Edward Island, which is really exciting. So we're widespread tonight. And it looks like quite a few of you, over 60%, um, are brand new to the program. We have about 10% that have uh, been doing the program for many years, a couple people that have surveyed the last couple of years, um, and we have some brand new people that have never been involved with the Citizen Science Program before. So welcome. This is a great starter program if you want to learn about citizen science because it's a species that's very easy to find. So hopefully you'll enjoy this talk. Um, funny enough, loons, uh, I would readily say that the common loon, if you if, if you want to end the polls and remove that, or do I need to? I can do it. Oh, there I go. Funny enough, the common loon is pretty much a species that is most commonly found in Canada. And the majority, probably it's not too far off that 77% of people in Ontario, the majority of them are found in Ontario. So it's interesting to see that um, spread of people. So to move on, um, 
I would like to tell you a little bit about Birds Canada. Birds Canada is a not-for-profit and probably many of people on this call know about us already, but our mission is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Ontario. What we have done very well for many years is to deliver high quality citizen science projects. Presently, we have nearly 40 citizen science programs with at least one operating in every province and territory across the country. Um, about 75,000 people now participate annually in our programs. The way these programs work is that we train members of the public to conduct standardized bird surveys in the field, and then we put the information they collect to good work into advanced bird conservation. Today's presentation will focus on just one of the citizen science programs, um, at, which is, of course, a Canadian Lace Loon Survey and the Canadian icon that we study, the common loon. Now, I will acknowledge that this is a topic that could easily fill up four presentations and we don't want to be sitting here four hours. So this is pretty surface. I will share some fact sheets at the end that will give you a little bit more places to look for additional information, but I can only cover so much in, in, in a reasonable length um, webinar. So just, just be aware of that. So a little bit of history about uh, the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey. The main reason for starting the program was back in 1981 in Ontario, there was a clear concern with survival of loon chicks caused by acid rain. And this program was started to assess the long-term health of common loons and the lakes they depend on in relation to the negative effects of acid rain. Um, they're um, a very good species to study something like this because the chicks gain the whole nutrition and whatever they need from a single lake. So uh, knowing what's happening on that lake, it's a really good, from the loons on that lake, it's a really good representation of what the lake is like. The objectives now, they've adjusted a little bit um, and we've had an ever-changing suite of, of um, variables that we've looked at. But in general, at this point in time, we've evolved to um, four objectives, the main one still being assess the trends and patterns of cotton and loon productivity. And I'll get into that term productivity a little bit more in a minute. We also identify factors that influence loon productivity. We do our best to contribute to loon and lake conservation. And we try to increase public awareness as well. So, what participants do, and this is a really simplified version of it, we'll get into a little bit more details later, but participants select a lake of the choice to survey. They make a minimum of three visits to each lake per year to determine the number of territorial pairs in the first visit, hatchling per pairs in the second, and the number of six week old chicks or large young is what we call them, per pair in the third. And that last one, um, the number of six week old young per pair per year, is what we refer to as the term productivity. And that's used throughout um, Loon scientific community in North America. Uh, we focus on that age, six week old young, like the one you see here in the photo, because um, once they reach this age, they are much less likely to, to be predated. They're much less vulnerable and they're more likely to survive to sledge off the lake. We find if we wait till they're an older age, um, they move around the heart of the track. There's a lot of variables involved that make this still the ideal count number for the species. Um, now, again, I'm not going to overwhelm you with data, but I wanted to give you a little bit of information about what the kind of data we collected. So this graph shows, um, as I mentioned, we do not track numbers of nesting or breeding adults. We do track the number of chicks that are surviving. And the consensus in the loon science community is that if overall the loon population is producing 0 0.48 chicks per year per pair, per pair per year, that yeah, half a chick per pair per year, um, then the population is stable. Now, there's a lot of assumptions behind that value, 0 0.48 chicks per pair per year, but it still works as a good estimate and it's likely close to the true value. So if the number goes above that, you're gaining more chicks being surviving than you need to maintain the population. If it drops below that number, you don't have enough. Now, you notice on all these graphs is a dotted horizontal line. That represents 0 0.4 chicks per pair per year. 
And you will see that in some areas, um, we're having problems. Species, this we're getting very, very close to not producing enough chicks to hold the populations in those regions. And that is a concern we have. This same data has been identified similarly in programs in Wisconsin and Minnesota. They looked at the number of returning young adults. So chicks that have survived and come back, and they are seeing a decline in population, and that population, that the chicks that are surviving and come back are just declining. And these three um, surveys together are causing some significant concern in the, the main reproductive center for um, loons, which is the Great Lakes um, Southern Canada populations. So um, if you want to put up the next poll, poll. So why loons? Loons are a fantastic species. Everyone can see them. As I mentioned before, they, they um, um, easily <laughs> represent what we all associate with cottage country. And so it's very important to um, know more about them. And while there are a lot of interesting birds on the lake, this is one that anybody can study. There's very few species that look similar. More often than not, you can see them with just an inexpensive pair of binoculars. They're easy to find and track. You don't have to do a lot of deep looking around. Um, and I just thought I'd start by going a little bit over the biology. And to start, I thought I'd ask a few simple questions and see what you guys know. The first one being, are loons seabirds or lake birds? How many chicks do they have? And the third one is, what do they need to have a productive lake habitat? And we'll just let this run for a few more minutes. Um, and then we will answer those questions and then go some of them will answer during the next slide but the first one we'll answer before we go forward so what do you think olivia do you think oh you never mind you're you're hidden that's fine i was just gonna ask you what you thought were they lake birds seabirds i can still see in here everybody it looks <laughs> like my guess would have been the same one as uh, about 70 percent of the people on this call that they are lake birds uh but 13% of people think they're actually ducks. And then we've got about 15% of people that answered seabirds. Yes. I'm going to disappoint everybody. I personally, and you know, it's all a matter of opinion. I personally consider them a seabird. The reason being is that they spend the majority of their lives on the ocean and they have a salt gland. So what that is, is they have a gland in the center of the forehead and it helps them excrete um, salt in the waters that they drink and salt in the food that they eat. So they're, they're very much evolved for that environment. And they come back to our beautiful, less volatile freshwater lakes to breed. Um, I'll just move down and give some answers. How many chicks do they have? I'll go over that a little bit later. But people are pretty close here. One to three is the normal. Never more than two. That is not. Um, they will have more than two. And there have been a handful of occasions where we've seen four chicks. Now, when I say a handful of occasions, right now, the belief is those are chicks that they adopt from other parents. Uh, but it has occurred. They do this every once in a while. Loons pick up other things to parents. It, it's, it's being more noticed in social media now through time. It's something that we never thought happened 10, 15 years ago. And what decides the size of the lakes that a loon needs? The length of open water, the shape of the shoreline, the productivity, or a combination of them all? Frankly, it's a combination of them all. And we'll go over that a little while afterwards. If I don't answer it well enough, go ahead and ask me again. Um, so I'm going to close that out and go to my next slide. And this is the busiest slide you're going to see tonight. <laughs> and so this is the basic life cycle of a loon. Um, so what is a typical year in the life of the loon? They start in the oceans. The birds that are coming for Ontario usually will come from the near shore waters of the Atlantic Ocean or perhaps the Gulf of Mexico, but I think predominantly it's the Atlantic Ocean in this region. Um, but loons will nest in any near shore waters along North America. 
or not nest will winter in any near shore waters along North America. And what they will do next is they will start as soon as the weather starts warming up, start migrating back. So they will come to a place like Lake Ontario or Lake Erie or uh, Lake Simcoe and wait until the the melt of the lakes for the north and then and they will stage them up and uncannily they know how to get to their lake just in time for ice out so it's quite common for loons to arrive within a day or two of ice out because they do the staging process through the great lakes so in the fall you'll often see loons on the great lakes in their wintering colors which is um the gray tone in the in the top left hand corner and in the spring you'll see them in the beautiful breeding colors of the black and white now once they get to the lake um, they don't nest in a hurry they typically spend um, a month to two months building body conditioning checking out the territory finding the nesting spot and then in may um, they will start um, their their um, process of laying eggs usually late may early june they will lay one to three eggs, depending on their health and body condition and the productivity of the lake. And they will be laid one to three days apart. Do they re-nest? They can re-nest up to three times. It's pretty rare. A second time is quite common. The One of the majority of causes of, of re-nesting in Canada will be water level fluctuations, drowning out the nest. Another may be predation. Um, and um, after they finally have viable eggs, they will incubate for about a month, 27 and a half days. And when the chicks hatch, which in the majority of Canada, it's not always the case, but in the majority of Canada, that's right around the Canada Day weekend, which as you no doubt realize is probably the worst day for a baby bird on a great lake, on a lake full of boats. Um, but they normally hatch right around the Canada Day weekend. And um, they are normally off the, the nest within 24 hours of the hatch of the last chick. Um, the chicks have a high level of care. The parents put a lot of effort. Both parents work on it to feed and care and brood the chicks, especially when they're young. You'll see them riding on the back of the chicks, a lot, the back of the adults a lot um, to help them thermoregulate and also to protect them from um, predators until they're too big. And when they're too big, like uh, the very center picture there, you're seeing your, your six week old. I would say that's probably closer to an eight week old chick there. When they get that big, they're still being fed, but Usually they start get, um, getting a lot of their food at about eight weeks of old and close to, and they're cared for there until they're 11 or 12 weeks. And at that point, the parents will leave the lake and leave the, the juveniles there. And the juveniles will be alone for a few more weeks. They will practice their flight. And then before freeze up, they will leave the lake as well. The juveniles will then, first year young, will then go to the natural ocean and they will stay there for at least two years. Usually it's about four years before they're ready to breeding, but they start potentially moving back at two years. So that's a really, really quick look at the reproductive cycle. And it's a pretty busy one. Um, so you'll have your, your adult loons on the lake from, say, April to May through to um, sometimes March through to S September, early October, and you'll have the juveniles there until just about freeze up. Well, what are ages of chicks? Uh, we talk a lot about the age of chicks here um, because it's quite important. The downy youngs are just a couple days old at most, and those ones um, are um, the most vulnerable. So we really want to keep an eye on when chick hatch happens. A small young, we call that two to three weeks. Large young is four to six weeks. The six week age is what we are looking for when we're doing our, our counts. And a juvenile one is beginning to look a lot like an adult loon. The pattern is a little bit different. They have a scale pattern on the back versus the, the wonderful square pattern of the adults. Um, now, what about the survey? What do we do with the survey? I get a lot of questions about how difficult the survey is, and it's not. It's deceptively simple, especially on the average lake. When you get into some lakes, this gets more difficult. Um, and what we look at is we track loon pairs, we track territories, we do not track nests. There's no need to with the species. And this um, 
map here will show you um, our sites through time for the survey. And um, we also don't assign lakes. So you pick your own lake and we know what is surveyed when the data comes in, which I think it's a predominant point that confuses a lot of people. Um, it, our world, it, it gains. It's rare that we get two people on the same lake, but that data can be made more powerful when it's worked together. So how do you decide your survey area? Um, the biggest thing to understand is decide a survey and where a territory is. People sometimes are confused by the idea of ter territory. Loons are an incredibly loyal species to the nesting area. Um, they stay put. Where, you, where they want to be, they will be. The, 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 the leading science behind this believes that the males, which the males do find the nest, and the leading science believes that it will take up to eight years for a male to find a highly productive nest site. And what they do is this kind of a hit and miss approach. They pick a location and they try to nest there. If it doesn't work, they go on the next location. So you get a lot of these starter nests until they find the right one. And when they find the right nest, they will stay there and they will use that for as long as they can. Um, so the best way to figure out where territory is, is just to remember that, that fact that loons stay where they, where they, where they want to be during the territorial season, which is that May, June, July time. Um, so you want to look for regular occurrences during that time. Mapping out your sightings help. And keep in mind, and this is a hard thing for some people to get, one loon may represent a territory. And the reason for that is because the other loon is always on the nest. So the one loon is foraging or um, displaying on the territory while the other one is on the nest. And that's quite common for 30 days. Um, territories on a big lake will often be separated by visual or physical barriers. They will, loons don't mind talking to each other, but I think when they're really territorial, they prefer not to see each other. Uh, they have to have very quiet nesting locations without a lot of wave action. I should have mentioned earlier, loons cannot walk. So um, their nest has to be quite close to the water's edge and water or waves greater than six inches up or 12 inches down will cause either flooding of the nest or abandonment of the nest. Um, you won't find territories in open water. Um, you will have a lot of loon visitors in June and July, especially um, if you have productive nests, because that is when loon pairs start looking for territories for the next year, is in June and July, quite often. Another great way to look into where on your lake the loons are is to use eBird Canada. And this is Real Lake, which is in um, the Muskokas. And I pulled it up to show where loons have reported on this lake. Now there's only two reports, which is kind of unusual. And I think that's because nobody's put a bother to, to add eBird data to this lake. So I'd like to encourage people, wherever you are, put your data into eBird for all your casual observations. But even here, you can see two locations where potentially there could be um, nearby nests. Now let's look at a lake that I know has nests and that is Char Charbot Lake. And this one I've been to, and there's pairs in several little nooks and crannies. And here, when you start, and there is so much data on eBird associated with this lake, I took the time to filter it down to just data from June to July, when the pairs should be active, um, and for the last 10 years. And even from that, you can see a bit of a pattern of where the loons may be on the lake and where they might be nesting. So this kind of information will help you decide where to survey. But the bottom line when it comes to surveying is um, these are huge lakes. And most lakes are one pair, maybe two pairs. And so they're pretty easy to figure out where to survey. But on these big ones, there's no expectation that you survey the whole lake. Um, the expectation is that you survey within the bounds of your life on the lake. So what I mean by that is you, you visit the lake when you're there in areas that you will cover. There is certain times that we do need you to survey. We need you to get out there in late May, early June, just to find out if there's pairs on territory. And then again, in late June, early July, depending on where your lake is, to figure out if there's chick hatch. And you wanna get that date as close to chick hatch as possible because that's a vulnerable time. You could have 
to catch and lose it if you wait too long before you, you check. And then we want you to get back out in late June or more likely August, all depending on when that chick hatches. So six weeks after chick hatch, um, so that you can um, see if you have any chicks survived. Those are the things that we are really looking forward to the program. Um, and we don't expect you to make special trips for this. Some people have to. Usually the activities can be within your normal behavior on the lake, like perhaps the boating um, path that you take to get to your cottage, your favorite fishing hole, your favorite paddling um, area that you want to paddle, all those things can be considered. The view from your cottage windows might work as well. Um, but for some people, they do have to make a special trip to the lake. And again, it's usually not that difficult as long as you have those three visits. It becomes difficult if you um, don't see loots, because then you have to put a little bit more effort in it, maybe go a little bit more often and check all those nooks and crannies, because adults will hide chicks and um, they could be on a nest or they could be just not obvious at the time. They could have a feeding lake as well. So you want to make a point uh, of looking extra if you're not seeing loons on your lake. Uh, so how do you decide the sections on a big lake? Well, as I said, you make sure it's an area you spend time on. Make sure it's an area you could realistically cover. Like to say that you can cover all of Charbot Lake would probably be an unrealistic thing to do, unless you want to spend your whole summer spending every day looking for loons. I'm okay with that if you want to. Um, add the nearby open water areas. It, they're not usually found in a lot of open waters, but every time you'll see a member of the pair out fishing there or the loons moving their chicks around. So a little bit of scanning of the open water that's adjacent to your, your quiet areas is worth your time. Um, if you enter your data online, there are options within the system for existing sections on your lake. In many cases, not always, we don't have all lakes in the system. Um, in those cases, you may just find that there's a section very similar to what you plan to survey, and you can just choose that and tweak it a little bit um, so that the data collected is similar to what was collected in the past. If you choose to um, provide paper results, and both are equally okay, no problem with either one, but if you choose to provide paper results, just put as much information as possible on your survey area and we will figure out the section after the fact. And if we have any questions, we'll reach out to you. Okay, you spend, you, a section is where you spend time, you can realistically cover, and you include the open water areas. And if possible, adjust to match pre-existing sections. So this is a big lake and we have a lot of questions from associations and I don't know how many people from associations we have here, but um, they often wonder how to split it up. The first year I would just say, just automatically split it up around where people are or around what makes geographic sense. And then after you start seeing data, some sections may need to be bigger some next sections may need to be smaller. So there's often adjustments to sections on big lakes after the first year. And that is okay. I can work with you and we can sort that out and we can make it suit your association and your lake coverage the best. Now, what do you do with the data? Um, and how do you register? Those are two very important questions. I think most people here have registered already, but if you want to participate, I would suggest two things. You um, go onto the website, um, birdscanada.org slash loons, and you read the participant fact sheet because that tells you how the program works. And then you click on the volunteer portal and you sign up. And the other picture here I have is just a tablet view of what the volunteer portal looks like. And there's a spot that we can sign up to and it's hosted by Nature Counts. So you may be involved with other programs in Nature Counts. You'd want to use the same login as your other programs. Um, and, or you can create a do login, but you just have to sign up for the program. And then the other thing you will have to do afterwards is you have to log back in and tell us whether you want a paper kit or paperless kit for the year. And I advise paper kit for the first year, just because there's so much that's new, you're at the cottage, you're at the lake, who wants to be on the computer? Have a copy you can keep at the lake and leave there for the next decade or in the boat or what have you. So you have it there if you need it. Um, so here it is again, you will see that um, 
when you're logged in, this is something people miss quite easily with the volunteer portal. It's easy to think you're logged in when you're not. So make sure it says your name or your login address. Um, make sure you tell us what you want a kit. And then when, if you go to conducting your Canadian Lakes Loon survey, it tells you all the information there for, your, for surveying and how to submit your data. So a submit your data option. Um, I'm not gonna go over submit your data. It's a complex system. There is um, a technical webinar on the front page of the Loon Survey webpage. And in the fact sheet I will provide people, it also includes that webinar split into four sections so you can learn each section. But I did want to talk about the other thing that's very important, and that is to look into ways we can help loons. There are some, it's very easy to get in a position when you think there's no way you can help, but there are ways to help. And there's three ideas circled in yellow, dispose responsibly, reduce your impact, and get involved and raise awareness are three things you can do from anywhere in Canada, not necessarily in the lake. The other things, keep your area wild, um, boat with care, steer clear, use lead free, free tackle. Those are all things that you can do at the lake. A reminder that whatever you put in your storm drains and down your sinks and up in your drinking water and in where these fish and where birds live. So you wanna be careful with that. We also have materials that we can share, um, signage for lakes, uh, this PowerPoint production, um, other uh, materials on the, the loon survey pages that you can use to uh, help steward loons and any water birds on your lake. Now, there's a lot of questions always come up about platforms. Being humans, we want to fix problems. We're very big on fixing problems. The thing is that problems are not always easy to fix. And platforms will be highly successful in the right locations. If they are used in the wrong locations, if they are the wrong platform, um, if it's not the problem, they will cause, be unsuccessful at minimum or they could cause a loss of chicks. Um, remember that platforms are designed for where water level changes are in May and June. That's where they work the best. We suggest that you want to have at least three chicks with no hatch on the lake, on the whole lake, not just at your place, but on the whole lake before you consider them. Um, you should never put a platform outside an existing territory. They should always go within an existing territory. There could be other problems like um, on the lake, perhaps there is natural nesting sites presently that are empty. And then that's one way of telling if there's other problems. Platforms are big, heavy. Uh, a, a loon platform, it looks like a little island and it weighs a ton. So who's going to look after that platform? Because somebody must take responsibility for it. And um, who's going to ensure it stays safely away from the boating community? Uh, when you're building your platform, think uh, like a loon. They like things that are simple, a scrape of mud, lots of camouflage from avian predators close to the water. Ask for help. I'm there to help anybody who has questions about whether their lake is appropriate for platforms or not. We also have the standards for um, North, Northeastern Loon Working Group standards for platforms on our website, as well as our preferred platform instructions and a blog on how to decide what platform to use. So the information is there for you to have. And that's it. Um, I will end here and say, glad I was able to attend. Um, I would like to thank all our volunteers because this is a volunteer driven program. They do all the hard work. And I'd also like to thank them for the donations because this program in itself is funded by the members and supporters of Birds Canada. And without those funds, we would not have 40 years of data to share. And um, that's it, Olivia. Kathy, thank you so much. Um, we have some a nice chunk of time here. We're able to tackle a lot of the questions that have come in. Um, would you like me to read them out to you as we go? Sure. Uh, is that helpful? Here, I can, I'll pop myself back up here and then, uh, oh, there, we're together again. Lovely. Okay, uh, the first question we have, um, was uh, the loon survey years ago used to be more detailed. Why was the form and information survey simplified? Oh boy, the reasons. 
Um, you're making me think back. Um, I remember those days. The biggest thing was we found that the survey was complex for the data we needed. So it's quite common whenever you do a citizen science project like this, you throw a lot of potential questions out there and you sit there and find out from that what data you can work with and then you simplify it so that you're only forcing your volunteers to collect what you need to have. So you're right in the past I think it was 13 weeks age of the chicks a whole bunch of stuff on um, development and on development of lands and things like that and the other thing is with the advent of so many great resources for satellite imagery and stuff if we want to know the development of lake shores it's pretty easy to come out without having to to ask someone so i guess it was about two no it was earlier than that 99 yeah 99 2000 they decided to simplify the program based on our science committee to what we felt was what we needed to have to do it right Okay, that's great information to have. Um, and hopefully that's reassuring for the new people that um, this is a, a good citizen science um, program now, to jump into. Ironically, I do want to add a few of those points back in at some point if we get the funding to do it. I would like to see us look again at phenology as we are seeing changes in climate is the species behaviors changing? And that's a very valid question that whole, we're, we're actually working with, um, we're bringing in a postdoc through the North American Loon Research Working Group to look at all the data collected on loons across North America to find out if there's other variables that we should bring back into the picture. So there may be another change before 50 years. Well, that is the next question I had lined up. If ice out is occurring sooner because of climate change, will loons adjust and arrive earlier? It's a tough call. It looks like right now they're just showing up and building body condition. Well, they might arrive earlier, but they don't, they're not seeming to nest any earlier. We have a couple spots in Canada, Rideau Lakes and BC are two locations where they tend to nest earlier. But so far, we're not seeing those changes in behavior elsewhere in Canada. Okay. Okay, great. Um, Back to the questions. Does a loon leaving for ocean for breeding for the first time return to the same region where it was born? That for a very, very long time was difficult to answer. But there's been some great work um, on banding chicks and on satellite telemetry on loons. And we believe at least the males, because the other cool thing is males yodel. So we can tell males and females because females they yodel. Um, and a yodel is kind of like a fingerprint. It says exactly which loon that is. Um, and we have reason to believe that chicks from nesting sites in Wisconsin are returning to nearby lakes. They're not going to the same territory, but they're coming to nearby lakes, which is pretty cool data to be able to say that at this point. Yeah, that's very exciting. And to have a bit of a footprint of where the loons have have been, which is awesome. Um, next question is, um, if I hear a loon but don't see it while I'm out surveying, do I count it if I know it's on my lake? What are you counting? That's the question. You're counting pairs on territory. So the next question is, is its territory on your lake or is it a feeding territory? I would say be aware and try to look for it. Because if it does have a territory on the lake, eventually you should be able to see it. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Um, we have a question if uh, reminders uh, to survey will be sent out at those key times that you mentioned. Unlikely, um, just because of the nature of the beast. I do send out a few reminders every month, but remember some of those things are dependent on your lake. Like if you have a re-nest in July, then your six weeks are into late August. But if you have a Rideau Lake where the hatch is in mid-May or, or, or mid-June, then your six weeks is in mid-July. So it's more of a case where um, you have to watch what's going on in your own lake. Now, granted, my experience is it's very rare that people just survey three times a year. They're on the lake anyways, so they tend to know exactly what's going on with the loons every day, and I hear all about it. Um, so I don't honestly think it's that productive sending a reminder. We do send out newsletters 
but not really a reminder. Yeah. Yeah, I find once you get really excited about doing the survey piece, you're you're going to want to go and do it all the time or at least have your eBird out and have your reportings <laughs> going. Uh, thanks, Kathy. We have a question here. We're new to the program but have not received our welcome package yet. Can you advise? Um, packages went out last week. So if you registered before May 3rd, your package is in the mail. If you registered after May 3rd, I'm mailing your package next week. Um, English digital kits go out tomorrow or the next day. Frankly, it doesn't really matter if you're doing online or if your package show lakes, because all the information is up to date on the website. So if you're waiting, you can go and re read it on the on the Nature Counts portal as well, the volunteer portal. Okay, that's great. Um... Someone is asking if they can change their preference for the kit format. If it was paper and I've mailed it, no. Well, you can. You can still use just online. That's your total choice. You, um, But if you want a paper and you said online first, go ahead and email me and let me know. And I can either change it or just pop one in the mail for you. Thank you. Uh, and did the majority of lakes in Ontario have looms? That's a tough question, mainly because the majority of lakes in Ontario are outside of where the people are. Um, and we tend not to think of it. There's over a million lakes in Canada. Um, I would say the many, proportionally more lakes in cottage country and for the north, north have, have loons. When you're getting south of, say, Barrie, you're starting to get very few loons on the lake. Um, and that actually, I wanted to specifically mention that because we also have the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas now. So I know that there are some cool places in Southern Ontario that loons have nested in the last 10 years. So if you know of one, make sure you share that information with the Atlas. That's important to know. And they're rare events. And they've got me scratching their head because they seem to be on gravel pits and things like that. Bizarre. Luther Marsh has loons nesting on it. So strange. I'm still hung up about the point uh, that you made that loons can't walk. Loons can't walk. They're totally designed for swimming. The feet are put so far back um, on the body that they kind of do this shuffle with they use their wings kind of like crutches when they're walking. Wow. Um, I, I remember a rehabber telling me once, me once that they can't walk at all, but they can run downhill really fast which I thought was funny. Um, it's a funny visual for <laughs> sure. But the other thing is, if you ever run into a loon on the ground, don't underestimate it, how fast they are on land, even though they can't walk. Because if they decide to jump at you, they can cover about four feet real quick. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. Well, they are a massive bird. So yes. uh, yeah, you've come and been warned tonight. <laughs> Um, is there an ideal time of day to look for loons and for nests? Well, we don't look for nests. And the reason being is um, because loons are so secretive and um, we're better off having the next. The best the best protection for loon nests in Canada is the fact that nobody knows what they are. Then they're not being pestered, right? Because everybody wants loons pictures. Um, the best time to look for loons probably is in the morning or the evenings because they're more vocal and you can key in on the vocals. Like obviously they're vocal at night as well, but you can't really see them. But mornings and evenings are a good time. But usually there's one member of the pair out on the lake at any given time. So it often will match your time on the lake. Okay, that's good. So always be scanning. <laughs> um, question about photographs. Would you like photographs for promotional use and how would we submit them to you? Um. I would say the best way would be through the the, cal the calendar competition is happening again this year, isn't it, Olivia? It is. yeah, Birds Canada has has summer. a yeah has yeah. A, a calendar competition and they like bird photos for that. One thing that I love and nobody ever sends to me and I ask for it all the time is people folders, photos of people doing stuff for loons, watching birds on the boat, pointing at loons, things like that are fantastic tools for me and I never have them um and those you can just email me but take advantage of the count I think there's prizes for the calendar competition 
Yes, yeah. I believe so. And often if you submit a photo to Birds Canada, there might be someone that comes back emailing you at another point asking if it could be used for other projects. So we do have ethical guidelines and they are on our website. So you may want to check that out. I think the one thing, it's probably a good time to mention, I prefer you to stay at least 30 meters. So about a hundred feet from loons at any time, because you can, even though you're there for a good cause, impact the way that they are looking after their chicks and doing their regular activities. And, and I will tell you that I can tell when I look at a photo, if a loon is being disturbed or not. Yeah, really important. There are ethics for bird photography and wildlife photography. As Kathy said, head to the Birds Canada website uh, to get full information. But um, yeah, it'll cover things like these are no baiting or we're trying to trick the birds into getting a great shot. We we won't accept those. Um, back to uh, the surveying. Can we survey multiple lakes this year? Oh, yeah. You just need a form per lake. Now, I say that with a qualifier. If you are brand new to the program, you'll only get one form. After your first year, you'll get a form for every lake section you return data on. So this first year, if you want to do paper forms, you have to photocopy it or print it off the website or something so you have enough forms. Okay, that's great. First years, stick to your lake. <laughs> um, question about... Um, contamination on the lakes would a large toxic blue green algae bloom on a small lake kill the loons at this point i would say no we're not seeing any signs so far of death from the algal blooms um we do see deaths from other toxins especially on the great lakes from the migrating in the past depending on the year um but one, some interesting things that are happening is one of the processes, and, and this is such a complex thing. If you want to know exactly what all the processes we're looking at for loon survival ship, you'll have to look at the 40-year report. It's too, 40-year report. It's too much for a single talk. But we're noticing that as you disturb your soil, or your lake, as um, lakes warm up and chemicals and toxins become more metabolized you're creating a situation where you're getting more mercury and or other compounds coming off the bottom and into the loons and that will cause poor parenting practices as well as many other things okay okay good to know um i hope that answers that question um so someone here says they've actually been on a lake for 18 years seeing loons every year and regret that they only discovered this um this program this year are you in any way interested in historical information yes and no um this is one of the few problems where we'll backdate data and that is because we know that there's naturalists out there who visit the lake every year and they will do enough visits that they collect all that information. But remember, we need those specific visits. We need to know every year if there's territories and how many. If they hatch and how many ha and, and how many territories hatch young and how many chicks hit that six week year, the six week old stage. So if you can provide that information great fill out a paper form and right now we don't have the ability to export it into the system you have to pretty much let us keyboard it in if you can provide that level of detail certainly send it to us but that's a fair bit to ask of somebody who's never been involved with the program before yeah fair enough um, for the past two years there have been loons nesting on my small lake i have never seen any chicks Last year, I even saw two large eggs on the nest at the end of July. Again, no chicks. Do you know what happened? Not enough information. Um, there's several things um, that could be going on. The one could be flooding, um, where the nest is being flooded out. Um, it's a small lake, so I think that's less likely, unless it's one of these. Uh, we've had a lot of, we're getting more and more of these fantastic rain events in May and June, and you have these, if you have a large watershed on a small lake, it can cause a flooding that nobody can stop. And so that's a concern. Um, it could be 
just the pair itself and not necessarily the same pair, right? Because of that whole thing I was talking about where they try one spot, if it doesn't work, they try another spot. So it could be pairs trying the spot and for some reason unknown, it's a bad spot, so they move on. Loons have poor parenting at the beginning of the parenting life and at the end of the parenting life. So it could be old pairs as well, which don't do as well with reproduction. So it could be many things happening there. We're also seeing, and we don't have it tracked well enough, which is something else that may come down in the future. We know that loons have their own black fly, um, which is weird enough. And we have seen in some places in the States, um, in cold, wet springs, the black fly numbers are so extreme that the loons will abandon the nest. So... Um, it's hard to say what is happening on a specific net, like at any given time. Yeah, so many factors, um, but good things to keep note of if you do notice anything that Kathy mentioned. Um, if there's more than one volunteer on, a, on one lake, uh, can they work together or is it best to work separately? Data reliability, question mark. It's tough to say what's best. Um, and, and a lot of it mean, Matt, means what your schedule works out like. If you know there's another volunteer on the lake, and it's, especially if it's a small lake, then definitely try to work together. And even if you split the lake in half and you each do a section, um, remember how you have those section options. Um, if, two, if we actually do manage to get data from two different volunteers on the same lake in the same year, and I tell you, that's very rare, we will have the capacity within the analysis to combine that data, which basically what we do is, is we take the appropriate information from it and just increase the effort when we buy, combine the two together. So it's not a problem if there's two people on the lake. I just know that people like loons are a bit territorial. They prefer to have their own area to survey. The difficulty is, is I can't really share information about volunteers readily. So if you are on a lake association, it's quite fair to put the note out that I'm collecting loon survey data this year. Is anybody else put on the group page? They all have group pages and email lists and, and things like that. And just put the information out to the group on your lake and say, hey, anybody else doing this? Yeah, connect if you can. We won't give your information out is the, the message here. Um, so someone says they have three loons on their lake now. Is one is this one partner and one pair? It's really early. Where is that lake? Does, do they say? Doesn't say. If you want to pop that in the, the chat and let us know where your lake is, we can come back to that one. Yeah, let's come back to that one because I'm very curious. It's, it's, yeah. I saw the loon documentary on Cottage Life. Awesome. And a U.S. researcher was interviewed and they banned loons. Does Birds Canada ban loons? No. We do not. It's a very expensive proposition banning loons. And you have to remember in Canada, it's a common species. In many areas of the U.S., this is a species of risk um, because they're French to the population. We have the majority of the population. On top of that, many of those groups also got money from the Exxon Valdez disaster to work on birds, um, water birds. Um, but that one project I was mentioning where they um, say that there's not as many young adults coming back. That's the same project. So working together and we're all the different loon groups right across North America, and there's a lot of them, are trying to work together to combine information and find a better way and more synergies. We all tend to work on the same project. We all, all tend to use that six week um, formula for chicks, but there's just so many different ways of looking at the data. A couple of questions here kind of asking around the same thing. How can you tell if a loon pair is on territory or just feeding on a lake? Very difficult. I would say the biggest thing to do is to look at the lake and does it look like it has a territory? Um, and probably what you have to do next is just wait to see if they have chicks is a big one. And um, the other thing is whether they're maybe listening when they're calling they will use the whale to talk to each other. So if you're hearing them talking to another loon on another lake regularly, it might be a sign. Okay, the question about um, the 
lake with three loons was near Prince George. And someone else said uh, they saw loons on their lake, uh, Benoit Lake in Ontario at the end of April. That would be normal. Like I said, right after ice out, they are there. Um, you can literally watch and move up Ebert and coming into Ontario with the ice out leaving. Um, Prince George is in that area where loons, for some reason, nest earlier. So they could have one on the lake. They could have one member of the pair that didn't come back. But being Prince George, I would be inclined to say they've got they've got somebody nesting already. Yeah, they went and clarified and said, uh, meant to say one immature and one pair. One immature. Oh, that's just because you're close to the ocean. Or perhaps they just haven't now. That, that's just because you're close to the ocean. <laughs> Um, do you notice the difference in loon success of breeding in lakes with different fish species? Um, and how, is there any connection with lakes that have like pike or muskie versus lakes without? Oh, excuse me. Somebody just brought a tick in the house. I'm not amused. Um, <laughs> um, at this point, there is not a fish I would say less lessens loon productivity. Um, they do very, very well on lakes that have bass and pike. Um, they're actually, their preference for foraging is perch and sunfish and things like that. Um, and that all comes down, the best way to describe it, if you look at the pattern of fishing of loons, and when they, they fish, they, they, they hunt in a zigzag, which is perfect for prey fish. Um, so they're more likely to take a perch or a sunfish than they would a trout. Um, right now, all we can see when it comes to fish productivity and even fishermen on the lake is that the more productive lakes have more fish, more people, and more loons because they're all after the same thing. That makes sense. Um, if someone enrolled in the survey doesn't end up seeing loon pairs on their lake, do you want to hear about that? Yeah, I would definitely the first year for sure. Um, it's always important to have that negative data, find out where loons are not. Um, I would also, I would also encourage people in those situation, situations to do checklists for the atlas, because then their data is going a lot farther, not just loons, because that's a, the, in, when the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas done or the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas is done, that data will then be used to look at range of species and where they are. So I can't undervalue the importance of anybody who can ID birds even remotely to get out there and do checklists for these programs? Yeah, for sure. Um, someone says they're new. Is eBird a website? Would you please clarify? You mentioned eBird a couple of times. eBird is a website. It's also an app. And, it's, and um, it's a fantastic app that was built out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that we partner with in Canada. Um, and it's basically what we call a checklist program where you can go in and you can check and count any bird that you see. It's got some cool features and they've shown that even with new birders, by using this app, it's got enough controls and it. it tells you if it's a bird that you're not supposed to see, if it's a bird you can see and things like that. It's a great way to learn your birds. And if you are new to the birding community, the one I would really recommend you try out is one called Merlin, which unfortunately there's so many other things out there called Merlin, but you want the Merlin birding app because it will, is great for learning bird ID. Awesome. And recognizing that we're at one minute to the hour here <laughs> uh, with over 40 questions submitted oh and my. unanswered. Um, I'm just going to let people know that a recording of today will be shared with you, as will a fact sheet that Kathy has put together um, about the, the survey itself with lots of great links, uh, and hopefully that will answer some more of the questions. Um, if you haven't uh, taken a look at the Toronto Bird Celebration website, there are lots more free events happening this month if you're located in the greater Toronto area. Um, and a couple more online ones, I believe. Um, but again, look for that next spring. It happens every year, as well as um, programming on the Birds Canada calendar on that one, on that website. Um, there are uh, over 40 citizen science programs um, that are currently in motion. Uh, so if you find yourself looking for more Beyond Loons, check out the Birds Canada website for that as well. Uh, Kathy, do you have time to stay on for a few more minutes if I throw a couple more at you? Sure, go for it. And, and if you want to send me the list of what's left over, I'll add them to, uh, if, if I can, I'll add them to the fact sheet. 
Okay, cool. Then we will probably do about five more minutes, uh, tackle some more questions here, and then um, we'll share that that document and the other information with you uh, in an email following this, uh, likely tomorrow. Um, okay, so back to the questions, anybody who's hanging around with us. Uh, for the past two to three years, we've seen several, several cormorants on our lake appearing for a short time. Should we worry about them competing with our loons? No, we have... Every study that we've seen so far shows that there's no competition. Um, and there's a lot of variables involved with that. But the biggest one, again, is I think you see them on the same lakes because, again, that's where the fish are. That makes sense. Um, the water level on our lake is extremely high right now. How might this affect nesting? They might nest in a new spot. It, as long as the water level stays consistent during the nesting period, which is like that may through the end of june is, is a typical um they're fine it's only when the water changes during the nesting period is there a problem okay um, do male and female loons both sit on the eggs uh, so when do you see only one out and could it could it be one or the other it could be one or the other they're very hard to tell apart technically there are some size differences but let's be real you can't really tell that easily the best way to tell them apart, if you want to tell them apart, is the male yodels. So they will be the only ones who do that, that yodel call and look it up. It's really fun to watch it if you see it on YouTube. Um, they both will um, incubate and they will both brood the young. If I recall, and don't, I'm not, I might be get this backwards, but if I recall correctly, the female does a little bit more of the incubation. The male does a little bit more of the parental care after hatch. So it all depends probably on the couple. Okay. Um, had, we've had um, loons on our lake for several years. We seem to always see a pair together, but there also seems to be a lonely loon. Is he or she a loner or are we just not seeing their mate? That's a very good question. It could be somebody coming in there to feed. Um, it's rare that a loon will enter another loon's territory without a fight. So, but if they're in a different part of the lake, it may be a lonely loon waiting for a partner. Um, it may also just be a non-breeder, what we call a floater. So that's a young adult who's not breeding yet. And they might just be visiting the area, checking out where they might want to nest in the future. Kathy, this person said that they've looked up their lake and there are many existing surveys in the area. How do they know if any of those are active surveyors? They absolutely no, you can't, because I don't know until the data comes in. Right now on our um, lake, which you'll get the link in the fact sheet, we'll tell you which ones are recently active, active in the last decade and active prior to that. Um, but yeah, if, if we've had so many people register this year, um, I, I won't. I wouldn't hazard a guess of where everybody's going to end up surveying. If you're on a large lake, is it okay to survey only one part? You covered that. Um, so yes, you can take a section of the lake with the answer. Um, I'll just do like one or two more, and then we're gonna we're gonna put a pin in it for this evening. Um, do loons choose lakes and not ponds due to the distance needed for the chicks to take off it's for the distance needed for the adults to take off as well um they need a big runway they also need a lot of fish so they want product productive areas both can get off ponds in much shorter distances than we expect but you got to have a lot of wind we haven't seen loon chicks in about three years when wake boat activity increased greatly. Is there a known correlation? Is there a known correlation? No. Is there a concern and suspected correlation? Potentially, it all depends on where your nest is compared to where the wake boats are being used. Now, what we're recommending for wake boats because they do so much erosion damage on the lake as well, that they stay in what we would call a fun zone, which is the deeper water in the middle of the lake. And that allows them to play. And at the same time, keeps the, the shoreline and the, the substrate at the bottom of the lake, which they can also impact safe. Awesome. Okay, Kathy, I'm gonna call it there. You've answered 28 <laughs> questions live tonight. 
Um, we still have 85 people on the call. Thank you so much for tuning in for your interest in helping conserve wild birds in Canada. This is so much of our work is driven by citizen science uh, scientists like yourself. So thank you for getting in and um, yeah, giving your time and energy to us. I'll invite you all to go on to the Birds Canada Instagram. We have a contest going on right now where if you tell us what birds you're seeing during the spring migration in your neighborhood, in your backyard, while you're out and about, you could win prizes from Fjall Raven, a pair of Koa binoculars, um, lovely birding books, and more. Um, as well, if you fill out the survey that I popped in the chat there, um, tell us how we did tonight. Was this a helpful event for you? Do you want to see more like this at the next Toronto Bird Celebration in 2024? Um, I Again, you'll be entered to win prizes and I'll just end by thanking Kathy for your time and your energy and for being so ready to answer 28 of the 60 plus questions that came in tonight. Um, I think your fact sheet is probably going to get some additions after this. Um, but yes, the fact sheet will be sent out uh, in the coming days as well the recording um, and know that uh, email addresses stay open and um, Kathy's pretty easy to get in contact with. So I'll include that in the post event email as well. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you soon and we can't wait to hear what your loons are up to this summer. Take care.